Thank you, first of all, for, for having me. Um, I'm going to give a very general talk today. Uh, the talk is one of these things where I, 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 the title itself is going to give away basically the crux of it, which is why symmetry matters. Now, I would not be the least bit surprised if in a Google audience some small, perhaps some large fraction of you were physics majors in college, just out of curiosity. One, two, three, et cetera. Um, I stopped counting after three, perhaps out of ability. Uh, but one of the things, one of the things that is not obvious, even by the way, as as a as a physics major in college, is the sort of shorthand that physicists, especially, sort of use to describe the universe. They'll say, you know, some theory is elegant or beautiful, or they'll talk about the importance of symmetry. I mean, here's a very famous quote by the Nobel laureate Phil Anderson, which is, "It's only slightly overstating the case that." The study of physics is the study of symmetry. And yet, typically when you see physics in high school and you see physics in college, even if you take advanced courses in graduate school, it's very equation driven. Uh, the idea of what it is that underlies our assumptions about the universe, how it is we got to where we are, why it is that, that physics is sort of held up as this paragon of a beautiful academic discipline. Why is it the universe itself is so beautiful? That you don't learn about as much until much, much later, until you delve much, much deeper. Indeed, I will say that even as a practicing physicist, until I'd started working on this book, I didn't fully appreciate how much of what we know is really undergirded by sort of these beautifully symmetric, uh, simple, in many cases, uh, assumptions about how the universe works and, and how much can be drawn from that. So I'm going to begin with a, a sort of working definition of what symmetry is. This is given by the mathematician Hermann Weyl, which is basically a thing is symmetric if there's something you can do so it stays the same after you've done it. A wheel, a circle, for example. I can, I can turn a circle in any given direction and it is the same as it, as it was before. Or just another very simple example, a triangle. Now, a triangle isn't quite as symmetric as a, uh, as a circle is because there's only a couple of things you can do. You can rotate a, a triangle, but only by a specified amount, only by 120 degrees, a third of a turn. Or you can uh, reflect. I'm drawing it as a rotation in the bottom there, or rather my great illustrator, Herb Thornby, who did all of these, uh, is drawing it as a, as a rotation, but it's really a reflection. We're just taking the triangle and we're looking at it in a mirror. And you know, we can talk about geometric objects uh, till the cows come home uh, and say, yes, they are, of course, beautiful. There is something very nice, pleasing about it. Uh, for those of us who simply enjoy puzzles, there's something appealing to the human mind. And I, I, I've just I've just picked a, a few very natural examples here of symmetric objects in nature, uh, symmetric objects in art. Um, the Taj Mahal, for example, architecture, uh, flowers. We've got an M.C. Escher print. Uh, that's the Galaxy M81 in the lower right. And for those of you who don't do these sorts of things, um, I occasionally compete in the, the National Crossword Puzzle Tournament here in, here in New York. Crossword puzzles. Uh, obey, in, in the US at least, uh, a symmetry where you can either rotate them by 180 degrees or reflect them, and that's the rule for how the black squares need to show up, if you've ever noticed that the, the grids for crossword puzzles look also symmetric. And these things appeal to our mind. I mean, nature, nature seems to uh, enjoy symmetry, but symmetry itself seems to uh, appeal to our mind and our sense of order. It also shows up in scientific discovery. So when Rosalind Franklin, for example, took her, her images of the double helix, the, the, the fact that DNA has this structure allowed Watson and Crick, well, they, to uncover that it was a double helix, but also to start understanding how the, what the workings of DNA were. I mean, the, the double helix of, of, of DNA is, of course, one of these great natural symmetric objects insofar as you can take this thing and twist it and it will look the same as it did before. But it's worth noting, and, and, and the double helix is, is particularly interesting in this way, that it spirals in a particular direction. It's got one symmetry, that is to say I can, I can twist it as much as I like, but if I were to look at the double helix in a mirror, you could tell it was wrong. You could tell it did not come from a living being here on Earth. It would have the wrong orientation. So 
one of the things that's going to be very interesting for us about sort of understanding symmetries in the universe is to recognize symmetries are very beautiful. They're going to give us guidance. They're going to help us understand how things work. But there's a symmetry breaking here, or an asymmetry, that's going to, in some sense, give us even more information, that's going to allow for, it'll turn out, nothing less than our existence. So all will recognize these. I, I bet no small number of you will recognize these from a game-playing context of a name-brand uh, role-playing game. You will also, by the way, notice that there is one missing. Uh, these are the platonic solids. They are also those applying the D&D &D dice. Uh, the missing one, of course, is the D10, uh, which is not, uh, which is not, in fact, a platonic solid. It is known as an a anti-di pyramid, uh, and has the beautiful name Bimbo's Lozenge, uh, and doesn't have those properties. But the platonic solids all have wonderfully symmetric properties, and many, many thinkers in trying to uncover sort of the secrets of nature, assumed that the platonic solids and the sphere, which is basically the platonic solid with an infinite number of faces, uh, that the platonic solids must ultimately give some sort of clue as to how, how the universe works. I mean, the sphere, of course, is, is the most obvious. The sphere uh, prompted Aristotle, for example, I mean, he assumed that because the sphere is this perfectly symmetric thing that it must describe nature. We, we owe ultimately to him and his contemporaries the idea of the celestial sphere, the idea that the Earth is at the center of the universe, that the orbits of the various planets are embedded in, and, and, and the sun for that matter, are embedded in spheres around us, and that the stars are at the most, uh, the most distant sphere of all, and that that must somehow, because of its beautiful simplicity, that that must somehow somehow be a representation of nature. Now, the spheres were wrong in a lot of ways. I mean, not least of which the sun is not at the, the, the center of the, uh, or the, the earth is not at the center of the solar system. Uh, the sun is. But there are other reasons as well. I mean, even if you accept that the, the, the sun is at the center of the solar system, something that I'm hoping you will accept, uh, we're still left with the fact that even the orbits of planets are not perfectly circular, or not, obviously not perfectly spherical. They're elliptical, and it turns out that there's going to be a deeper, be deeper explanation for that. Even as we moved forward, even when, when thinkers started to recognize that the sun was at the center, they still tried to exploit a lot of these wonderfully symmetric uh, figures in order to describe the universe. This is Kepler's awesomely named Mysterium Cosmographicum. And basically what he did is he took the various platonic solids and the sphere, so there were five platonic solids, the sphere gives us six, and there were six then six planets then known uh, out to the out to, to Saturn. And he said, oh, you know, six uh, six plus six platonic solids, uh, including the sphere, six uh, planets, maybe they're related somehow. And he kept embedding them in this turducken of a cosmological model to try to figure out, he said, oh, you know, once these things if you embed the one and the other and the other and the other, they represent basically distances, and those might represent the distances, the relative distances of the planets from the sun. And there might be something profound and fundamental about that. Uh, it turns out, obviously, that any match you have to this is entirely coincidental. Coincidental plus the fact that, you know, if you mix and match them uh, in any given way, you know, you have six factorial possible orderings. You're going to get close with one of them, presumably. Uh, but that was sheer luck. We owe, of course, uh, to Kepler, we owe our knowledge of the fact that the planets move in elliptical orbits. Ellipses, at first glance, do not seem terribly symmetric. Uh, it will turn out, and we owe this to Isaac Newton, that, sure, the orbits themselves aren't elliptical, but the force of gravity is. The force of gravity acts the same in all directions. And that is a very, very important symmetry of nature. I should note, by the way, that uh, the only reason that Kepler did not uh, immediately hit upon the idea of planets going in elliptical orbits, despite the data that he got from his, his mentor, uh, Tycho Brahe, was he just assumed that he didn't even try it. Uh, because he figured if, if the orbits of the planets were something as simple as an ellipse, surely someone would have come up with it already. I think it's giving his predecessors a little bit too much credit, perhaps. So. It is interesting to note that 
when we talk about symmetries in the universe, what we really mean is, what are some ways that you could adjust, say, the entire universe, uh, turning the universe, for example, or moving forward or backwards in time, or moving throughout space, and the laws themselves don't change. So the laws of physics are the same here as they are here. And the only reason anything appears to be different is because of my relative motion, say, compared to all of you. Or you know, if I were to go a 1,000 miles up in the air, things are different because of my relative position to the Earth, but not because of anything fundamental about the laws of physics have changed. So the laws of physics basically say that all of these things, time, orientation, positions in space, none of those matter in the physical law. Now that actually is incredibly helpful. That's way more helpful than you might think, simply saying the laws of physics can't be dependent on any of those things. It means, for example, that if you're to describe a giant equation that describes all of the physics of the universe, where you are in it can't ever appear in that equation, or when it is can't ever appear in that equation, or there can't be any equation that ever describes things with an absolute direction, won't ever appear. That makes, that makes the equations a lot simpler than they would be otherwise. Those things turn out not to matter uh, and are symmetries of our universe. Other things seem like they might matter or might not matter. One of them is physical scale. And this is a, this is a, a trope of sort of science fiction and children's books and things like that. You know, Horton Hears a Who or The End of Men in Black. The idea that, you know, you can take our universe you know, we're, we're this giant universe, and we have these things called atoms, and if you look at the old models of atoms, atoms look a little bit like, you know, a sun with things orbiting around it. And you can imagine thinking of that and saying, oh, you know, maybe those, maybe you could be a, a tiny little creature, uh, you know, living inside of that very much, you know, with a life very much like a human beings, except much, much, much smaller. Maybe, the, you know, the universe on, on various scales is, is almost identically the same as it is on the human scale. Uh, and we're just not able to see it because our, our perception isn't good enough. Uh, you know, th this is the sort of question you have very, very late at night in your dorm rooms. Um, I think it'd be prudent, as this is going to go on the web, to not go any further. But, but you get the point. This is something we might think of as a, as a property of the universe. And the question is, does physical scale matter? Well, one of the great thinkers on this subject was Galileo, who decided to who decided to ask the question in sort of an absurd way, um, which is to think about the existence of giants. So there are you know, biblical descriptions of the ages of giants. And if we imagine a giant as merely looking like a normal human being, except scaled up by a factor of 10 or 20 or however much, and this is the same premise as Gulliver's Travels, would, that be a would you be able to do that without re-engineering the entire thing? And Galileo says no. If you were to simply scale this, if you were to simply scale up a, a, a human to giant size, you'd have all sorts of problems. I mean, after all, if I make you ten times bigger in every direction, you become a thousand times more massive, a thousand times more weight to support, for example. But the strength of your bones are based on the cross-sectional area. So if I make you ten times larger in every direction, your bones only become a hundred times stronger. You're supporting more weight per unit area, basically, uh, the larger you are. And so he said, look, you know, you'd basically have to totally redesign a, uh, the bone of a giant until eventually the, the thing was entirely bones. Uh, and the bones were incredibly, incredibly thick, and, and the thing wouldn't be able to function at all. And of course, the opposite is true. I mean, insects don't require uh, the internal skeletal structure that we have. They, are, they have an entirely different design. Uh, simply because, again, this is not a function of, uh, this is not a symmetry of nature, you know, which is, again, why Spider-Man is not such a, uh, a great premise. Um, you know, take a spider, scale him up to human size, and what? He'll squash himself. Uh, I, I, I can't skip this, you know, adorable uh, quote by, um, by Galileo, which, you know, he talks about an oak tree, uh, you know, we can't produce, nature could not produce a horse as large as 20 ordinary horses or a giant 10 times taller than an ordinary man. And then he concludes with this, this adorable imagery, which unfortunately does not carry with it a, an, an illustration. Galileo's work is filled with illustrations, but this isn't one of them. Thus, a small dog could probably carry on his back two or three dogs of his own size, but I don't believe that a horse could even carry one horse of his own size. I choose to believe that this experiment was never carried out. 
So some things are symmetries, some things aren't. But what about, you know, we have a human intuition about what should be a symmetry of nature. Antimatter is a very, very important. We, we see antimatter in science fiction all the time. We're able to produce antimatter in a lab. And if you know absolutely one thing, only one thing about antimatter, it's this. You know, if, if you have an antimatter friend, do not shake their hand. Why? Boom, you will be completely annihilated and converted into energy. But antimatter is really very much the same as ordinary matter. There is a, an antimatter version of every particle. An electron, for example, has an antimatter particle called a positron. Same mass, but opposite electric charge. And it is absolutely true that when you take matter and antimatter of the same particle type and bring them into contact, they will annihilate completely. It is also true, by the way, that uh, if you produce matter and antimatter in a lab, that we, t we are able to produce them in equal quantities. This raises kind of an important question, one that is not immediately obvious how to resolve it. Given the nature, given the similarity between matter and antimatter, given a very important fact, which is that the laws of physics don't seem to care whether you're talking about matter or antimatter, it's just the sign that changes, why is it, and given the fact that we produce and annihilate them in equal quantities, why are we here and made of matter? The laws of physics, I should say, are almost completely identical if we take matter and convert it to antimatter. I've got a little silly example here where I've done two things. Um, I've got a current uh, with, with a, uh, a current carrying uh, wire, electrons. Electrons have a negative charge, so they go the opposite direction of the flow of current. We owe that convention, incidentally, to uh, Benjamin Franklin. And it creates a magnetic field. And likewise, if we look at the same thing in a mirror and also change all of the matter to antimatter, we get the exact same magnetic field. There's something intimately related to mirrors and antimatters, and to antimatter. And that those two combinations of things, called CP symmetry, charge for antimatter, and P for parity or reflection, that seems to almost be a symmetry of nature. Almost. I mean, clearly, as I've said, it can't be a perfect symmetry of nature, because there is something different between matter and antimatter. And by the way, it's not just us. It's not just that we are all made of matter and the Earth and the Sun and the solar system are galaxy. Every galaxy seems to be made of ordinary matter and not antimatter. And we can tell that because if a galaxy and an anti-galaxy were to collide with one another, we would see that across space. And if there were antimatter galaxies, it would happen occasionally. And we do see galaxies colliding, by the way, and they just have the regular sort of gastro gastrophysics that you'd expect. There's only the subtlest difference between even the reflected version of uh, the CP, uh, CP transformation between matter and antimatter, um, and that is that we can see little things. I mean, for example, this is the, uh, the cobalt-60 decay. So you, you take cobalt-60, and atoms have these, this property called spin, which is, in principle, directly measurable. And it turns out that the ordinary matter version has electrons preferentially given off in the direction that the thing is, spin it is spinning. So you use this thing called the right-hand rule. And preferentially, things are, uh, electrons are ejected more in the direction of the spin than opposite the direction of the spin. We've got little hints like this, that there are, that there are slight, uh, slight violations of symmetry in nature. But we don't know where they come from. And they only show up in what is known as the weak force. The, the, uh, the laws of physics are sort of broken down into four fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong and weak nuclear force. And every one of them, except for the weak force, seems to not give any, any uh, concern whatsoever about the distinction between matter and antimatter. It's only the weak force that shows even the slightest preference. And that slightest preference seems to be you know, in very, very subtle ways. It doesn't even mean that more matter is created than antimatter. It's just in what we can do in a lab, we see very, very tiny differences that say somewhere in the equations, and we can identify those terms, but somewhere in the equations is a tiny difference. The universe knows about the difference between the two. But how did it choose that? We don't know. Um, here's just one other sort of illustration of the same thing. This is just a matter of a particle known as the, uh, the neutrino. Um, a neutrino 
is a relic, generally speaking, of weak nuclear interactions. And one of the things that's very interesting about a neutrino is that um, if, it is, if it is created in a reaction, it always flies out in such a way that it's spinning as given by your left hand. Anti-neutrinos are always spinning in a way that would be given by your right hand, where your thumb gives its direction of motion. And if, as I, as I was implying, they look basically the same if you take all anti-neutrinos and turn them into neutrinos and vice versa, and take everything and look at it in a mirror, which makes the spins go the opposite way. Except for that cobalt-60 thing. It turns out that we can even make that difference between matter and antimatter go away. Uh, there's a there is a uh, an interesting discussion, and I've I've excerpted it here. But the crux of it is in his Nobel laureate speech, uh, Richard Feynman, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, uh, was talking. He was relating a conversation that he had with his advisor, uh, John Archibald Wheeler, and you know Wheeler had this idea, and. He had a lot more that went into it. But the, the idea was, he said, you know, the physics of positrons looks almost exactly the same as the physics of electrons if you assume that positrons are electrons going backwards in time. And it's true. And so we ask the question. We've got this combination. We've got three symmetries that I've mentioned so far. Three symmetries, three very good approximations to almost perfect symmetries in nature. Take matter and turn it into antimatter, look at it in a mirror, and reverse it in time. CPT, it's called. And every single reaction in nature that we've ever discovered, ever, is totally, will work totally the same if you do those three uh, reversals, basically. Incredible, surprising. And also very, very weird when you think about it, because when you think about what that third one is, that third one, time reversal, time reversal seems like it is hardwired into our laws of physics, right? Time reversal should not be an even approximate symmetry of nature. I mean, after all, like, you don't know how this talk is going to end, but you do know how it started. You remember the past. You do not remember the future. There's a thing called cause and effect. I could go on and on. I mean, it's, we almost don't have the words to explain how weird it is that there is such a thing as the arrow of time, and yet there is an arrow of time. But that said, if you look at microscopic interactions, and after all, what are, what are macroscopic interactions but a collection of microscopic interactions, a big collection, you look at these things, and you can reverse them in time. This is my time mirror that I, that I had my illustrator draw. Uh, you take a movie of, say, two electrons scattering off of one another, and look at that scatter in a mirror. That process looks equally valid. I take the, a ball. I throw it through the air. Well, I throw it a little bit more professionally. I throw a ball through the air. It makes an arc. I take a movie of it. Watch that arc in reverse. It also looks like a valid trajectory that a ball could make. The, the laws of physics seem perfectly comfortable being run forward or reversed. But obviously, there is a complication. One that shows up in a, in a fairly complicated way, and that is with the idea of entropy. So entropy is one of these words that's thrown around. It's, it's generally uh, considered to be, you know, we talk about it as something like disorder, for example. But entropy, uh, you know, we, we think about entropy with, with gas molecules, for example, and entropy to a physicist is really just a measure of possibilities. So what we've got here is a little cartoon of gas molecules in a box. And we've got the same number of molecules in both, both illustrations, 10, jumping around. In the left box, uh, we've got almost all of the uh, all of the gas molecules in the right partition. Now, there's very, very few ways to do that. If I were to number all my atoms, for example, there's only 10 different atoms that can be the sole atom in the left, in the left partition. This is what's called low entropy, or very high order. In other words, it's like putting away your room. I mean, if, if there's, a lot of, there's a lot of empty space once you've cleaned up your room. On the other hand, in the right box, we've got this thing called high entropy. And high entropy is basically everything is much more uniformly distributed. 
I cannot stress this strongly enough because I think this is a very popular misconception about even people, even when people have encountered thermodynamics in high school and college. But this is going from low entropy to high entropy, something that is so well established that it is known as the second law of thermodynamics is not really a law at all. It's merely a very, very good suggestion. Even more or less even distributions like this, this right pan, right image are just far more likely because there's far more ways to distribute your air molecules than the, the ones in the left. It is absolutely possible, possible within the realm of physics that spontaneously all of the air molecules on that side of the room migrate for some short period of time over to that side of the room and all of you asphyxiate and all of you, I guess, get crushed from air pressure. We could probably survive. We could probably survive two atmospheres. I think you guys are going to be fine. I'm sorry to you. But it's incredibly unlikely that that would happen, but possible. That said, this is our biggest clue as to how the arrow of time works. The idea that things go from low entropy, high order, to high entropy, high disorder. We, we, it is within the realm of physics that if I break a, a, a set of cue balls, a racked set of cue balls, that you know, they're going to scatter around. And if I hit a ball in just the right way, that they might reassemble into a triangle. I would not try to make that shot. It would be almost vanishingly difficult to do so, but it is within the realm of physics. It's just there's not that many ways that a, a, uh, a set of balls can be arrayed in a, a triangle. It's extremely difficult. It's extremely unlikely. So the increase in entropy is a probabilistic statement of the universe. It's just there's so many particles out there that those probabilities become almost certainties. There are even games that people play. Uh, yeah, I like that. This is one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> There are even games that people play to try to see whether the second law of thermodynamics can be toyed with, not just in a probabilistic sense, but if we might be able to do this. This is something known as Maxwell's demon. The idea that we might be able to make a low entropy and a high entropy, uh, make a, a low entropy system merely by having a robot or some other brain open a box and let particles through depending on the nature of those particles. So in this case, we might imagine Maxwell's demon takes the high energy particles and tries to sort them to the right side of the partition and or left side of the partition and the low energy particles into the right. This would be a, a zero energy way of basically creating a refrigerator. Put all the hot air on one side, put our, all the cold air on the other, and that indeed would be a decrease in entropy. Uh, it turns out especially philosophers of science have thought about this. And one of the problems with, with a scenario like Maxwell's demon is that in making these determinations, you know, it isn't a zero increase in entropy. You'd basically have to have the demon itself uh, record, the, say, the speed of the particle in its brain. And then when it made the next measurement, it would have to sort of erase that measurement and put it again. And that erasure is going to uh, increase the net en entropy of the universe. So time itself seems to have an arrow. And if you, you'll notice that I haven't, actually, uh, I haven't actually resolved why it is that we have this uh, arrow of time, you'd be right. I mean, we do not presently know, uh, we do not really know why it is that there is the arrow of time and that it's one way or not the other. We do not know whether entropy increases with time or whether entropy is what makes time, the, the arrow of time. Uh, you know, one thing, one of the great observations that we've made about the universe is, um, I'm tempted to see, ah, yes, it is a pointer. This is the microwave uh, background of the universe, and it represents hot, hot points, those are the reds, and cold points in the universe, hot and cold in this case being uh, about one part in 100,000. And in the very early universe, the universe was very, very ordered, very, very low entropy. This is very, very smooth. And so the question is, did we live in a universe, uh, you know, did the universe start with low entropy, or are we only in a universe where the arrow of time is defined because we define the past as being low entropy? We do not know. Um, there are, however, other symmetries that we, can, that we can look at, and in particular, we see that the universe is largely the same in all directions. That is a symmetry not just of the laws of physics itself, but of the universe, apparently. 
Um, we can see that not just in the distribution of the microwave background, but also over here with the distributions of galaxies. And the question is, you know, what does this mean? What do all of these symmetries that we've talked about, what ultimately do they mean? I mean, many of them, you could rightly look at them and be like, yeah, that's an interesting curiosity. Yeah, sure, that's great. But why? Why do they ultimately matter apart from saying, isn't this beautiful? This is, after all, you know, we're talking about physics. We're not, this is not an art museum. We can't look at it to be beautiful just for the sake of being beautiful. So one of the great breakthroughs with regards to understanding why symmetry is so important came with a uh, mathematician by the name of Emmy Noether. Um, mathematicians tend to revere her, by the way. But many physicists either haven't heard of her or remember very vaguely hearing about Noether's theorem in one class when they were, say, a sophomore or a junior in college, and then they promptly forgot about her. She is, to my mind, one of the most important mathematicians that we haven't generally heard of. Um, and I was in the same boat. I mean, I'd, I'd seen Noether's theorem and promptly forgotten about it when I saw in college. And yet she is the foundation, in many respects, of things like supersymmetry and these grand unified theories and all these other, all of our understanding of why we have a fundamental unified theory, a standard model, for that matter, of particle physics. And you know, she, I, I, she's a very interesting case study for many reasons. I'm going to give her a couple slides because I want to point this out. She has this parallel, in many ways, to Einstein. You know, Einstein very famously toiled in obscurity in a patent office, in the Swiss patent office, until you know, his great breakthroughs, uh, his miracle year of 1905. Noether had similar, but you know, motivations for the problems were different, uh, around the same time. I mean, she was, she was born in Erlingen. and her father was a, uh, was a mathematics professor. Um, and the idea, you know, in, in, in 1898, you know, 1900 when she was when she was going to school or would have gone to school they basically said no we can't admit women that would overthrow all academic order uh, so she had to she audited all her class she was you know she was one of these cyber schools that we'd now have I guess um, and she basically went in just to take her final exams in Nuremberg which she of course aced uh, she pursued her PhD eventually of course this this uh, restriction on women was lifted she got her PhD at Erlingen um, and she wasn't able to get a position. She stayed at home, basically, writing important mathematics papers, occasionally substitute teaching for her father, and that was it. Until Einstein came up with his theory of general relativity. Um, so in 1915, he came up with his theory of general relativity. Everyone recognized the importance of it almost immediately. And Noether is invited by David Hilbert and um, Klein to go to Göttingen to explain it. They said, you know, basically, I'm sorry, the university won't pay you. I mean, uh, uh, Hilbert was this incredible advocate for her, but he was very unsuccessful for a very, very long time. But she went. She went and almost immediately um, created this wonderful work, which is known as Noether's Theorem, which I'm going to relate to you in just a moment. But it's, again, just worth relating a little bit more of her story. I mean, Hilbert, Hilbert, this quote here, you know, I don't see that the sex of a candidate is an argument against her admission um, as a private doesn't, that's basically an associate professor. Um, after all, we're a university, not a bathhouse. Um, she developed her theorem, and it wasn't, it wasn't for another seven, eight years uh, that she was able to get any sort of paycheck, an incredibly tiny amount. By the way, not just because she was a woman, but also because she was a pacifist and a Jew, um, uh, and a socialist, as I understand it. Um, 1933, Nazis come to power, and she goes to Bryn Mawr College, and sadly, about 18 months later, passed away due to complications uh, uh, from cancer, this surgery. Um, and it's just this wonderful um, uh, comment by Einstein, you know, the most competent and loving mathematicians know there was the most significant creative mathematical genius that's produced since the education of women began. And I mean, that's understanding. I mean, not just amongst women, but among men as well. She was just an incredible mathematician. So what is it she told us? What is it she said? I mean, Noether's theorem in words sounds very, very, it sounds pithy. It almost sounds content-free. It says, but it says that every one of these symmetries that we, we've been talking about produces a conserved quantity. And, and conserved quantities, I will say to physics, is the bread and butter of the universe. We, we hear about things like conservation of energy. Conservation of energy is incredibly useful because it says, look, if you start off with an energy budget, if you talk, start off with the sun, and the sun does something, the energy of the sun needs to go somewhere 
you know, either it heats the earth or it's converted into mass or whatever it may be, the universe will contain a constant amount of energy or electric charge or what have you. And what Noether said is all these symmetries, symmetries give rise to conserved quantities. So for example, the fact, what she showed was the fact that the laws of physics are the same everywhere in the universe immediately gives rise to the conservation of momentum. This is a big deal. Conservation of momentum, of course, was known. It's, it's Newton's first law of motion. Objects in motion stay in motion, blah, blah, blah. But that, that was the starting point. And what Noether's, Noether's theorem essentially did was she pushed us back a step. She said, no, there's something even more fundamental than that. Newton's first law itself is built on the idea of a symmetry, on the, on the fact that the laws of physics are, are constant in space. The fact that the laws of physics are the same in all directions, that there's no terms that tell you about a, cons a fixed direction in the universe, say that there's a conservation of angular momentum. The fact that the laws of physics are constant in time immediately gives rise to this conservation of energy, and there's more. Now, I'm sure some, some of you may have mathematics your mathematics background. I don't expect you to. Um, I don't expect you to parse this either way. I'm only putting this up here to talk about, just to mention how important this ends up being in our modern understanding of physics. Our modern understanding of physics is all of those fundamental laws of uh, fundamental forces that we talk about are fundamentally built on symmetries. And these symmetries basically describe how the quantum mechanical waves of of, of a um, of a system can be changed without any of the, any of the underlying uh, quantities changing and, and without the en energies of interaction changing. And it turns out you can, you can describe, for example, uh, U1. I'll just give this simple example. That's the phase of a wave. If you can adjust the phase of a wave uh, without changing anything, that's a symmetry. And what Noether, well, what her successors ultimately showed is that immediately gives rise to all of Maxwell's equations absolutely incredible, and show that there are conserved quantities like charges, uh, and subsequently predicted part, the, 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 the particle that's associated with that, which is the photon. In other words, Noether's theorem is the, the first, but an incredibly important step in showing, make this very simple assumption about how the laws work, and you get the nature of the interaction, all the equations, and the particle that relates it. Same is true for the weak force, which produced the W and Z particles, and for the strong part force, which created the gluons. All built on symmetries. Even if those symmetries themselves don't look elegant, putting a little plot of the, all the particles in the standard mod model does start to look symmetric. I mean, this, this does look much more orderly, where what we've got here ranked from bottom to top are the charges of the various particles and the various, there, there are also, besides an ordinary electrical charge, there are various weak charges that are associated as well. And we can plot these things, and yes, indeed, this forms a very beautiful pattern. So one of the things that physicists, modern day particle physicists do is they come up with models based on symmetries, and when you hear about things like at the uh, Large Hadron Collider um, or Brookhaven or elsewhere, discovering new particle that they thought to exist, it was because there was a hole in this diagram of what we'd actually discovered versus what had been predicted. Even other, um, e e even things that seem like they are symmetry breaking, and they are symmetry breaking, things like the, this great discovery about the Higgs boson, for example, are built on the idea of a fundamental symmetry of the universe. The, the idea of the, the, the Higgs boson is that there is an additional field, an additional field that, you know, you can look at that little pattern, was initially symmetric, but at some early time when the universe became colder, much like ice freezing into a crystal or anything else, that initial, uh, that initial symmetry breaking got frozen into the universe. The Higgs, yet another one of these fundamental discoveries of how we understand the universe to work, also built upon this symmetry foundation. So if there are such beautiful symmetries in the universe, and there are, the question is, why isn't everything perfectly symmetric? I mean, I, I've pointed to individual cases. You know, matter and antimatter uh, don't perfectly annihilate because there seems to be a slight symmetry breaking, blah, blah, blah. But we can ask the question, where did all of that come from? 
And the answer seems to be that for all of these symmetries in the universe, there's also sort of a corresponding uh, effect that makes the universe interesting, that, that can give rise to things like us that are complicated, that are, if you don't mind me calling you this, breaks in the uh, Mars in the beautiful simplicity and, and symmetry of the universe. And that is the, the, the randomness that comes from quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics produces, has random effects going into it. And you know, I've got a little, um, a little illustration here. You could imagine starting a series of tops, you know, just perfectly arrayed. Um, you may recognize these from a popular movie. And you know that if you start spinning a top, it'll eventually, a real top, will eventually topple. Or, or not, depending on you know, how much you choose to read into that. Um, but which one starts to topple first? And which direction it topples in. I mean, you can imagine these things, and you can see a few of them starting to topple, just in this case. That, you start with something perfectly symmetric, you add a random component, and all of a sudden you get some beautiful, beautiful structure. And in short, that is the story of our universe. Thanks very much. Questions. This is the this is the point where we have questions. Is that right? Uh, so you were talking about how all the particles have uh, anti versions of themselves. What about the photon? Is there an anti photon? So you're right. I I, I did do a little bit of a little bit of shorthand because I didn't want to do too many caveats. You're absolutely correct. There are a few, very few, fewer than you'd think particles that are their own antiparticles. A photon is its own antiparticle, um, as is the Higgs boson. Uh, but most other, most other particles um, are not their own antiparticles. So one of the nice things is that, um, so for example, if I take a, an electron and a positron, particle and antiparticle collide, it creates two photons. And there is no distinguishing between which one's the, 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 the particle version and which one's the antiparticle. But you're quite right. Uh, what's your personal opinion of supersymmetry, given that LHC hasn't found it yet? So that's a really good question. So supersymmetry, uh, supersymmetry involves a, um, just to give a background to those who are unfamiliar, uh, supersymmetry involves the relationship between the two different fundamental types of particles. Uh, there, there are particles called fermions that are electrons, uh, that are the quarks that make up our protons and neutrons, basically the particles of matter. And there are, there are uh, particles called bosons, which are essentially the force carriers. Those include photons and gluons and the Higgs. And the idea is, why should we have two such different groups of particles in different quantities? And not just why should we, but there's other, there's other technical reasons. Uh, you end up with, for example, certain particles based on interactions uh, should be hugely more massive than they are because the fermions sort of subtract mass and, 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 and uh, bosons add mass. And you know, unless they cancel or partially cancel, what ends up happening is you, you end up with a huge, uh, huge deficit one way or the other. So there's a lot of sort of fundamental reasons. And the idea that, that people have come up with is that for every fermion, there must be a corresponding boson. And every boson, there must be a corresponding fermion. And many of these particles are undiscovered. Many of these particles are likely to be unstable. Uh, one hope, by the way, is that there is such a thing called the lightest supersymmetric particle, uh, one that probably doesn't interact very strongly, like called, which we sort of have a placeholder called a neutralino. Uh, that might be this missing dark matter particle that we've been looking for. But we haven't detected any of these partners. And experiments like the Large Hadron Collider are capable of measuring some of these in principle. Now, and hasn't. That's, that's the, the, the upshot of your question. So now you're caught up with the actual nature of the question. So the problem is, I mean, the supersymmetry is such a beautifully elegant theory. And here's the problem with it. I mean, it solves a lot of problems in, in particle physics. It is almost impossible to disprove, because the number of parameters that you can keep adjusting, this is what's called minimally, minimal supersymmetric model, uh, you know, which 
with reasonable parameters that most physicists would agree are reasonable has been essentially ruled out. But you can keep adding bells and whistles, and you can put in unreasonable, unreasonable that doesn't, don't disprove the model. My personal, my, my personal feeling is it's grasping at straws at this point. I don't know what the better solution is. Um, you know, it might be there might be a more complicated version of, of supersymmetry that, that could turn out to be correct, but it's not looking good. And in fact, that's the position I take in the book as well. I sort of say, look, here's, here's why we introduce it. Here's why there are problems. It hasn't been observed. And every time, every time the, the, the threshold for observation gets higher and higher, things look worse and worse. Um, so honestly, my gut is saying at this point, no. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, I honestly don't. And I really don't know what a better answer is. Yes. Hi. So <clears throat> I have a question about um, the arrow of time. OK. So I've heard that general argument about um, how like things are differentially symmetric in time. So like you can go backwards in time and it still looks like physics. Um, but every like a lot of the arguments I hear about the arrow of time being biased in the way we perceive it isn't this differential argument. It's this argument about ensembles and entropy and stuff like that. So to me, like those two thoughts in my head are not like reconciled in any constructive way. So could you like elaborate on the relationship between those two? Right. So I mean, yeah, I tried to I tried to um, take you know, chapter two, entire of chapter two of my book and, and, and brush it into about 30 seconds of exposition here. So I, it, it's a fair question. But so, so the issue is we've got two different, we've got two different senses, at least two different. Philosophers would probably give several more of the arrow of time. One you could call almost a psychological arrow, right? They're remembering the past and not the future. You've got an entropy, uh, you've got an entropy arrow. Uh, which is the en the increase in entropy goes toward the future. We've also we've also got an arrow of time, at least in, in the equations, or we're implying them in in the weak force because we say the arrow the arrow goes this way, and that's the one that defines you know how matter works and so on. And so, part of the problem, this this so part of the problem, and and this is something I try to approach. Uh, in the book by getting humans out of the equation entirely. Like, we don't know how brains work. But thinking about how, how a robot or a disk drive or something like that would work. And, you know, you're, you're a robot, you're awoken, you look, at your, you look at your disk, and you do not know. I mean, this is not about the arrow of time. This is just sort of about the relationship between information and entropy and memories. You look at your disk. And you see that all of your bits are set to zero. And you'd say, OK, this, you know, this is a clean slate. I am, you know, I'm starting, I have no memories. On the other hand, I wake you up as a robot, and there is this pattern of zeros and, and ones, a complicated pattern, not you know, zero, one, zero. It's some, some complicated thing that you, can't, that you can't figure out necessarily what it means. You don't know anything else. The question is, are those legitimate memories, or is that noise? We've got basically the same. We've got the and in the end, we, this is something we, we we have no great reconciliation to because our universe did start with low entropy, and yet there's no physical principle that says why that should be. And so the assumption is either there's a physical principle we don't know, or you know, entropy, you know, it, it, there, there are two states of the universe, one at low entropy and one at high entropy. And there is another physical principle that basically says the arrow of time is by definition moving from the low to the high. Now, I'll tell you what my problem with that is, the, the sort of entropy making time. It is almost impossible to ever describe a single state of the universe. And because the universe is not causally connected at any point to one another. So saying the universe is increasing in entropy is an almost meaningless, is an almost meaningless statement because there's no process by which something over the entire universe can be integrated and calculated. So the fact that the whole universe or some part of the multiverse is, which is now not causally connected to one another, where some property defined over that entire region then defines the arrow of time, I don't see I don't see any mechanism for how that could work. So we we, we do we it is it is absolutely an open question um, as to you know why why the one should be related to the other. 
the fact that you know the fact that time the fact that time exists as a dimension that behaves very very different from space like one could almost make an anthropic argument about that so you know time does behave differently from space regardless of which direction the arrow of time is the fact that there is a dimension means that we can do things like learn from the past and and and, and uh, uh, make inferences and 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 so on um, which we would not be able to do in, in quite the same way if we lived in, say, four dimensions of space with a universe with no time at all. Uh, so, and it may be that there are parts of, you know, if you believe in the multiverse, there are parts of the multiverse with different dimensionality, and we are simply here because this is the most complicated one that is anthropically favorable, such that, you know, we, were, we, we would be able to exist at all, or anything would be able to exist at all. So. I, 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 realize, I, I fully recognize I've given you a non-answer, but I've hopefully sort of at least laid out the space of the problem. Yes. So this is a question about Noether's theorem. Sure. And the weak force. Sure. So in Noether's theorem, the, the things that are invariants like space and time give us various conservation laws like momentum and, and energy. So in a sort of not too mathematical, elaborate way, what's the non-conserved thing? What's the, what's the variant? What is the dissipative piece of some equation that gives us the lack of conservation of so, CPT and weak force? Uh, so it's um, so the, so the answer is it, it's it's not a matter of saying that it's not a conservation. It's more a matter of saying that there's a very specific thing that is being conserved, and it's it's the handedness, right? It's the fact. It's the it's, it's so it's a matter. It's not just a matter of creating. Um, in the weak force creating particles of all type, it's that when you create a particle, uh, you're creating a left-handed neutrino, specifically a left-handed neutrino, and specifically a right-handed anti-neutrino. And what that means, the, the, the reason that it's left-handed versus right-handed, means that essentially you're creating half as many types of particles. You know, we, we, we think, oh, well, what does it matter whether the thing is spinning this way or spinning that way? But from a physics perspective, those are two different particles. Uh, and so what it means is that we are, essentially, we are essentially getting half as many particles out of the equations, half as many particles getting dumped out of these equations as we might, ha as we might otherwise have if the thing was both left-handed and right-handed. We're only getting, you know, so we're only getting one. So from a practical perspective, um, when we think about all the statistics of the universe, the num you know, we count, we count in order to figure out things like pressure and so on, how many different particles could exist. Um, electrons, which can be either spin direction, we count for two. Neutrinos, for each species, we only count for one, for exactly that reason, because there's essentially half as many effective species as there might otherwise be. Other, other questions? No, thank you. Oh, thanks so much for coming.